Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested.com here at CES 2016, and we could not leave CES without chatting with our friends at Oculus. Now, as many of you know, Oculus announced pre-orders and the pricing for the Consumer Rift virtual reality headset earlier this week, and it's $600. Now that took a lot of people aback because they'd been assuming maybe a price point of in the ballpark of $350. And so we're here to chat with Palmer Lucky to learn exactly what goes into the Oculus, why it's costing $600, and what we can expect as the product will be released in March and Q1 of this year. All right, so I'm so thrilled to be joined by Palmer Lucky, founder of Oculus. How are you doing, Palmer? I'm doing good, let's shake hands. Let's shake hands. It's the proper thing to do at CES. It uh, is. We are sitting behind the final Rift packaging. I know there's a lot of Goodies near in here, near final. If it feels good, that's something you want to get across. Yeah. It's, it's quality materials. We were rubbing yeah. our faces on it earlier. Uh, I know, it's nice. And everything that you get with the Rift, people who pre-ordered, pre-orders are up now. They're finally up they're finally after up. all this time. This is where they're going to get starting March, end of March. March 28th, there's March? a hard date there. That is wow. the date we are going to hit. No more no more vague, vague dates. No more, no more announcements at this time. Yeah. It's happening. So the pre-order went earlier up this week, and I know you did a Reddit AMA, but I want to talk about some of those points you did address. Let's do it. Uh, the price point is $599, $600, and you guys are shooting for high-end VR. So where does that $599 go? So, I mean, there's a lot of complex things that are in the Rift. You have multiple high-end displays, a high-end tracking system, a lot of fancy mechanicals that need to be lightweight and durable and precise and never go out of alignment. You have a lot of ergonomics advancements that have happened since the DK2 days, a lot of moving parts inside of it. It's really, we think, going to be one of the, I really think it's one of the best consumer electronics values out there in terms of what you get for $599. I'm not saying $599 isn't a high price point, uh, but if you looked at something like a tablet you get for $599, a TV you buy for $599, a phone you get for $599, all of those were built for a fraction of that cost right. and you're spending $599, we're not making money on the Rift. When you spend $599, you are getting an insane deal. So, you know, take us back to a couple years ago. You've been prototyping the Rift for a long time. We saw the DK1, DK2. We obviously know consumer Rift has a lot more functionality, you know, positional tracking, 90 hertz. You need the specialized panels for that. At what point did you decide you didn't want to just use as many off-the-shelf components as you could, that you needed to do a lot of custom stuff. So it wasn't driven by a, a want, it wasn't driven by, driven by a desire to go custom as it was a need to go custom. DK2 was as far as we could push things. You might know the DK2 panel was basically a Note 3 panel that we made right. some modifications to. We were driving it as fast as we could, doing a bunch of fancy stuff with low persistence, but 75 hertz is not enough. Like we didn't arrive at 90 hertz just by accident. We arrived there through perceptual psychological testing that showed that, well, there's a threshold for conscious flicker perception and a threshold for subconscious flicker, de flicker detection. And we wanted to get above the threshold where the vast majority of people would not have subconscious or conscious flicker perception. And that's kind of in the high 80s and getting to 90 is really a right about where you're able to be. Like, it's no coincidence that there's so many people that are kind of converging on that point. It's that, that, that is where you need to be to kind of start tricking the human brain. What's in the Rift is kind of the bare minimum, it, the final Rift is what the bare minimum to really trick your brain and deliver presence. DK2, we could have delivered it as a consumer product. We could have done that. It would have, it would have cost more than the 350 we sold it as a dev kit for because we would have had to do a lot of things to actually ship it as a real consumer good, not as just a development kit. Um, but and I think the Rift makers, is, they're not making 90 hertz panels now. That no, you see, we, we had we had to work on a lot of these things, you know, to build VR panels from the ground up that were made for virtual reality with high fill, high frame rate, uh, high resolution, high pixel density. So I'm we're going to be the economies of scale that help drive the price down in the future. Is it going to be you guys making more? Is are the you see? I mean, it's going to be us making more. It's going to be other people getting into the virtual reality industry. I mean, honestly, the more people that are building these types of panels, mm. the cheaper it becomes for everybody. But also, display technology just always advances. It continues getting better, pixel densities go up, the cost goes down. We're gonna benefit from that in the long run. I mean, look at phones that came out, flagship phones in 2009 for seven or $800. You can buy a phone today, five or six years later, that is better than those phones for less than $100. And the same thing's gonna happen. The displays in the Rift are gonna cost a fraction of what they cost today in just a few years, because that's the way the display market goes. Do you foresee the Oculus being at the forefront and not taking the hand-me-downs from the phone makers and still 
researching and making custom hardware and, and getting things right to your standards? So, I mean, we're, we're looking at the low end and the high end of things. With Gear VR, we're able to kind of work with a partner to target mm. the lower end of the market. With the Rift, we want to do the things that we are uniquely positioned to do. We want to do the things that nobody else is doing, like dumping huge amounts of money, time, and manpower into developing new virtual reality technologies, new display technologies, capture technologies, optical technologies. We've got the biggest team I think that's ever existed in the world of working on virtual reality. And we're gonna see stuff continue to rapidly progress and we're gonna keep seeing big advancements coming because we are so early right now that we're nowhere close to having fixed all of the known problems, the problems we know we can solve. So let's talk about input for a little bit. It's gonna come with the Xbox One controller. It's a great right. controller. It also comes with a little remote. What's the remote for and what can it do? Right, so the, the remote is honestly a pretty, it's pretty much a consolidation of the input features that are on Gear VR. So that you, it, like any app that was built for Gear VR that's ported to Rift is gonna be able to work with this without having a full game pad to use it. That's also really useful for media stuff. Like if you want to watch a movie or play certain types of simple games, you don't have to have a full dual-handed game pad. If you wanna hold a drink and you wanna hold a remote, mm -hmm. this is definitely gonna be the best way to do it. But it's, it's not tracked in any way, there's no It's not tracked anyway. any it, way. It's a, it's a very simple, very, cheap device, I mean, not cheap, I guess low cost. It feels pretty nice, but it's, it's a low cost device. Uh, the idea is that this is an additive thing. You're able to use it, let's say that you are using demos, whether the demos where you want to move from scene to scene, you can stand up and just hold this thing or you know have it clipped on or in your pocket or whatever. It's easy to hand to people and just go back and forth, back and forth, play, pause, volume up, volume down without using a complex gamepad. And it has a removable battery in it, but the battery should, like you can technically remove it, but it should last for about 4,000 hours of use yeah. and should stand by for a, in, much longer than that. So it's a, it's basically a nice addition to have around and use. It adds a couple bucks to our right. total cost. And for some people, it's gonna be really useful. So there's no touch in the controller in the box right now. The there touch is controller. no touch and in I this box. I know you guys announced that touch can be pushed back a little bit to Q2. What's changed from the, the half and prototype? Type. So what you guys are doing now with Touch? So we can't talk too much about the changes. We talked about some of them in the blog post, mentioned that we have some architectural changes that are gonna let us deliver a better experience. Uh, is it ergonomics? Is it, it's, is it both hardware and software? It's hardware and software. I can't talk about the specifics just yet, but we will be showing it. And I mean, you, you'll be able to see the differences. Um, but one of the reasons we decided to do this, but there's, there's kind of two reasons. One is that we had made significant advancements behind the scenes compared to the touch prototypes that we've been showing off in the past. And we feel that touch is going to, like the type of input you get with touch is gonna to carry over into the future of VR. It's not just a one generation thing. You're gonna have similar things in the future. You're also gonna have you know full hand tracking at some right. point, but you're always gonna want the ability to have a track device that feels like a prop, that gives you haptic feedback, that gives you some traditional inputs like So buttons. there's a fundamentals that you want to change. Right, the... and, and, and we didn't want to make something that future games would, where we'd have to change the hardware of the next generation in a way that would hurt existing content. We wanted to make sure the thing that we ship is something that we're really proud of that's going to carry over into the future, you know, be the right thing for the long run. The other reason we made the decision is because honestly there's, this is it's kind of an extension of the reason that we didn't bundle touch in the box. Um, we developers have been building gamepad content for years. There's very few games being developed for motion controls. And like, don't get me wrong, I, the developers who are doing it are super brave guys. I think they're doing amazing things and it's gonna unlock a lot of possibilities in VR. But it's just the reality that games like Valkyrie and Lucky's Tale, Edge of Nowhere, these games have been in development for years using gamepads. It's gonna be a while before we have games that are that in depth and that quality for motion controllers. What we don't wanna do is, like the reason we didn't bundle it with the Rift is we didn't wanna increase the minimum barrier to entry just to force people into playing games. That honest, like a lot of racing sim people just don't care. I would actually get emails from people who are like, Palmer, I'm a racing sim, don't, and this was before Touch was ever announced. They're saying like, don't include stupid Wiimotes or something stupid now that you're owned by Facebook. I just wanna use it with my racing hardware. And there were a lot of people like that. We want the minimum barrier, we want the minimum barrier entry to be as low as possible. And then people can buy something if they want it on top of that. Absolutely. Not feel like they're being forced to buy something that they might not use. We kind of saw this with Microsoft when they launched Kinect with the Xbox. A lot of people said, hey, we don't really want to play that type of game. Like I could see where people want it, it's not for me. And they ended up backtracking, pulling it out, changing their plans, and that caused a lot of pain. We wanted to make sure that Touch was something that launches with plenty of content, where people who want it can buy it, and people who don't necessarily want it or want to see 
wait for more content to come out, are able to buy it if and when that happens. Now on the platform side, ecosystems can be really important. How important is it to you that you develop a, like an interface that people are gonna live in the Rift and use that as a way to browse games, use it as a way to, to launch applications and not be constantly taking things on and off? And what are the super, things that are important? Super simple. And you can see a lot of this with Gear VR. Uh, I was talking with another guy who said his dad doesn't know how to turn off his phone, but he does know how to use Gear VR because you know it's a mechanical docking action. You put it on, and then our menus are really easy to use from there. We're doing the same thing with the Rift. You can make a high-end enthusiast product and still make sure that it's not impossible for people who are hardcore gamers or hardcore technology people to use it. We want you to be able to download our software, plug in the Rift, click a button, and everything's running. And it has all the social connectivity, friends lists. Right, and exactly. all so, so social connectivity, friends lists, all the software browsing features, library launching features, a lot of cool features that are built around specifically being a VR store. For example, when you go to the store page of a game, developers are actually able to show a capture of a scene from the game as the store page. So instead of just having a screen, you know, screenshots or videos, you can also have kind of a hint or a preview. Is the software being more than just a front end? Is this what? Is the store gonna be more than just a front end, or more than just a store front end? You think? In what way? More than just launching games, and is, is there gonna be more reason to be in the Rift than to launch games? And I mean, I think it's going, yes, but I think, it's, I mean, it mostly is going to function as a portal to other software. We're not okay. trying to make, we're not trying to make, the Oculus Home is what we call it, and like you've seen it in the mm -hmm. touch demos and stuff, yeah. and like we're not trying to make that the place that you always hang out. Got it. Uh, I, I'm, there will be some interesting social features around that, but mostly we're trying to make a lightweight client that lets you get in and out of VR experiences as quickly as possible. We, you know, we want you to be able to launch this thing, get into what you want really fast, and then make it easy to get out, get into something else without you know, going through a bunch of pain. One last question. Rift high-end device, is VR going to hit mainstream in the way that a lot of people say it's going to be this year? Or is it really, should we consider it more like high-end PC gaming, the first couple of years of that, maybe the first couple of years of high-end smartphones, and it's going to need um, a, a little while to trickle out? I mean, so Gear VR is already getting some pretty mainstream adoption. There are a lot of people buying Gear VR and using that, and I think it's because there are tens of millions of people out there with good, with high-end Samsung phones. And actually, the majority of the user, the use time we're seeing on Gear VR isn't even games. It's actually people using it for social stuff and video stuff. So there are a lot of people out there who want to use VR, uh, and you know now. And the Rift isn't isn't even out yet. With the Rift, the biggest barrier is the cost of the PC, not the mm. headset. Let's say that we had made a headset that was three ninety nine instead of five ninety nine. Yes, that would cut the cost for certain people who already own high end graphics cards. But when you're talking about the mainstream, when you're talking about bringing VR to everyone. Most people would have to buy a brand new PC. And lowering the quality of the headset isn't gonna change the requirements you need to have a good VR rendering PC. So you're talking about getting that all in price from $1,500 to $1,400 to $1,300. Neither of the, like none of those prices are the point where it's gonna go from gamers to the mass mainstream. The Rift just isn't going to hit, it just isn't going to hit I don't want to say your mom, but the median mom is not going to be the person this buying the Rift. At least not this year. I mean, the quality is going to go up over time. The cost is going to go down over time. And eventually, two important things are going to happen. There's going to be a lot broader base of content coming out where everyone feels like there's something that they're interested in using. Not just gamers, not just people want to use it for education or medicine or training, or but something that everybody feels like they can use. And we're seeing a lot of content come from Hollywood that's kind of focused around those mainstream audiences. I mean, like the LeBron James thing on Gear VR is getting a ton of, of attention. Uh, and that's from normal people. Like mm -hmm. not, I don't think tech enthusiasts are the market for a LeBron James video, uh, and, and you know, the mainstream is. The other thing that's going to happen is eventually, as we continue working with partners like AMD and NVIDIA and Intel, normal computers are going to be powerful enough to run VR experiences. And that's the holy grail. Once you don't have to buy a new PC, once you know that the PC you have is enough to run a Rift, you drastically reduce that all-in adoption cost. That's when you get the median mom buying a virtual reality headset on PC. All right, looking forward to those ultrabooks that can run VR. Thank you so much. Yeah, wait. Yeah, thanks so much, Walmer. Thank you, guys.